Hello, we're glad you joined us for this live webinar, From Bits to Bedside, Translating Big Data into Precision Medicine and Digital Health. I am Christina Mahalik of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars. To learn more, visit LabRoots.com. Let's get started. You can post questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them in the Q&A box, which will appear when you click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the screen. This is an educational webinar, thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dexter Hadley, MD, PhD, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics, Institute for Computational Health Sciences, University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Hadley's expertise is translating big data into precision medicine and digital health. His work has resulted in an ongoing precision medicine clinical trial for ADHD for a first-in-class non-stimulant neuromodulator to be targeted across the neuropsychiatric disease spectrum. His laboratory was re recently funded by the NIH Big Data to Knowledge, Knowledge to Initiative to integrate multiple large-scale open databases to allow cross-platform computational analyses powerful enough to discover the functional genes and the related biological pathways that are defective in diseases. He received the inaugural UCSF Marcus Award for Precision Medicine to develop a digital health initiative to use smartphones to screen for skin cancer and reduce the mortality of melanoma. In general, the endpoint of his work is rapid proofs of concept clinical trials in humans that translate into better patient outcomes and reduce morbidity and mortality across the disease spectrum. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Hadley. Dr. Hadley, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Christina, and uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting me. Um, I'm going to tell you today about probably the last 10, uh, 15 years that I've been working in uh, biomedical research and some of the experiences I've had um, in that time uh, really with a focus on translational research or um, bedside um, impact. Uh, first, some disclosures. Um, I've co-founded a, a few companies. I advise for some others. I received numerous um, grants and awards to fund my work. Um, the first time I heard about precision medicine was, uh, well, one of the first times, at least in the public domain, was when President Obama um, spoke about it at the 2015 State of the Union Address. Um, and the reason I didn't know about precision medicine is because we used to call it personalized medicine uh, before that name was coined. And, uh, much of my research after medical school was, at, um, was involved in personalized medicine, um, i.e. finding uh, personalized drugs for, um, for diseases that, patient, that may be specific to a patient. So when I think about personalized medicine, I think of this little uh, schematic here where there's a disease, uh, there's some defective pathway that, uh, usually some defective genomic pathway that um, is incident to that disease, and the whole idea is to find a targeted intervention to rescue that defective pathway. So the, um, th those of us in, in, uh, uh, that have done biology know that multiple defective pathways can manifest similarly 
in complex disease. So uh, here's an example of, by that definition, a personalized approach to treatment um, where there's um, fever, for instance, I have three kids and there's a test to decide who's going to get treated for that, for that fever. So if, uh, if one of my children has a temperature, that child will receive Tylenol. Uh, I can argue this is not a, a good example of personalized medicine. I mean, it is a test before we treat. However, we actually don't know um, the defective pathways that are associated with most fevers. There's a, a number of different molecules that have, have been implicated. What we do know is that Tylenol is very safe. So, um, uh, but this is not what I mean when I say defective defective medicine. Uh, I'm sorry, personalized medicine. A better example is, um, is Herceptin for a specific subtype of breast cancer. Um, what happens, uh, pretty much the standard of care for breast cancer now is there's some kind of genomic uh, molecular profiling. Uh, Oncotype DX is one of the, one of the most uh, used tests. It's a microarray test uh, that looks for the presence of uh, HER2, her a test for the receptor status for HER2. And uh, Herceptin um, is a drug that targets HER2 and this is what I mean. We know HER2 is defective in breast cancer and uh, Herceptin rescues that defect. So our goal, or what I, the project I worked on for many years was to um, develop a Herceptin uh, across multiple diseases or any disease, to be honest. And the focus was for autism and ADHD, neuropsychiatric diseases. So the first part of my talk, I'm gonna tell you about how we use a genetic screen uh, to find a potential uh, defective pathway that we can correct. We have a drug to correct and potentially target patients. So, um, so, so this is a big data talk and the big data that, that uh, I'm going to talk about for um, this genomic work in ADHD came from the Center for Applied Genomics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, this is a pretty dated slide from, um, I believe, 2008, 2000, uh, 2008 or so. Uh, and it's a slide of the largest biobanks at the time that had been planned. Here's Children's Hospital of Philadelphia among the largest patients. The original goal was um, to establish a biobank and build up that biobank within five years. And when I came on board CHOP, uh, it was about five years in, and the idea was to really translate that massive trove of genetic data into, um, into clinical impact or, or, or uh, or translate uh, into drugs and biomarkers, essentially. Uh, so here's a more up-to-date slide on the Center for Applied Genomics. Uh, something like 1.2 patients visit the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia every year. Close to 10% um, of all rule out disease patients come through CHOP in North America. Um, that means uh, they, have, they have very large scale uh, automated robots to manage samples. There's huge data sets. Uh, every patient that's enrolled in the study, uh, the genetics is measured from anywhere from half a million SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms all the way up to two million as the technology has changed. Huge data analytics, uh, servers, supercomputers, et cetera, to, 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 um, to uh, be able to um, process that data and actually make inference, scientific inference. And of course, uh, this is a live biobank, so to speak. 85% of patients have uh, informed consent to be reconsented, meaning if we do find something in people enrolled in the study, we can actually go back to the patient uh, to suggest a potential uh, intervention to improve their condition. Um, so in my time at, at, at CAG, the Center for Applied Genomics, um, you know, I'm very proud to have have contributed to this type of pipeline, which can rapidly move from the biobank and this, this genetic and phenotypic information that is so rich, um, that, they rich that they collect um, straight through to proof of concept clinical trials. And we were able to do the work I'm about to describe within two, two to three years, basically uh, go from um, um, genetics or data to a drug and a clinical trial that's been FDA approved. And the idea is quite simple. So we have this large biobank full of data. Uh, there's some kind of screen, in this case it's genetics because it's a genetic biobank. Uh, so based on the data that is generated from the actual samples in the biobank, uh, we come up with risk factors or, 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 or genetic or genes that are enriched um, 
at the single gene level, and then we can put genes together into pathways. Genes don't operate in unison, but they operate in pathways with other genes. Um, and then based on defective pathways, we can come up, come up with uh, useful therapies that target those pathways and test those therapies in the patients we predict they're going to work in in a proof of concept clinical trial. So when I say genetics, most people think about sequence. Um, that is one type of genetics. The, the other type of genetics is the copy number of uh, the, the genetic sequence itself. So how many copies of genetic sequence we have. And the idea is the more copies of genes we have um, being transcribed is the more proteins um, uh, and a, a more significant impact on the um, pathway level than single nucleotide polymorphisms, for instance. So I mean, uh, you know, so one type of genetics is, is SNPs, SNP, single nucleotide variants or single nucleotide polymorphism, um, where a single base pair is changed. So I am speaking about copy number variation where there's whole deletions and, and duplications of stretches of DNA. So one can imagine if part of uh, your first exon for a gene is actually missing, there's a huge functional consequence to that as opposed to um, a potential base pair change that may or may not be functional. Uh, so, um, you know, in 2007, 2008, when this work was really being, um, when these samples were being genotyped, um, what we used uh, is we used the technology to call single nucleotide variants, which is essentially an optical technology. So um, these machines uh, shine light onto samples um, with and without probes for a particular variant, and based on the, the differential intensity reflected by the light that is shown onto these samples, um, uh, calls are made either for or against a particular allele. We take the actual raw intensities off of this machine. Um, we take the raw intensities and the actual allele call, and we generate what's called hidden Markov models, which were state of the art at the time, uh, uh, that infer hidden states along the sequence of of genome or chromosome, uh, and they look for stretches of increased or decreased uh, intensity. So increased intensity means a lot of DNA, which is probably some kind of uh, duplication of the, of the DNA, or decreased intensity um, is probably a, a paucity of DNA or a deletion of the genome. Um, uh, we published this in, uh, in um, genome research, and it's one of the most highly used methods. Pen C and V is one of the most highly used methods to call copy number variations from genetic um, SNP association data. Um, and basically, we, we, you know, common things being common, ADHD is the most common neuropsych neuropsychiatric disease in a pediatric population. We were able to look at 13,000 different samples about 3,500 cases with ADHD, 9,000 controls without ADHD. And to cut a long story short, we were able to implicate this uh, metabotropic glutamate receptor network as highly significant in a subset of patients with ADHD. Um, so what this network shows is that um, uh, it's, it's a protein-protein interaction network, essentially. Um, this is defined, uh, th this is defined um, um, a priori by yeast 2 hybrid, very large yeast 2 hybrid screens that define all the protein protein interactions. And when we overlay copy number defects, the red and the green on this chart indicate deletions and duplications, uh, respectively. Um, when we overlay the colors, we see that um, uh, many different genes in this network um, are, in fact, um, affected by both deletions and duplications. Uh, we found a a similar, we took a similar approach to autism, which is uh, arguably a more difficult phenotype to characterize than ADHD. And we looked at 19,000 samples that we, we analyzed for copy number variants, six and a half thousand cases with autism, 12 and a half thousand controls. And we see a similar pattern in the, in the uh, metabotropic glutamate receptor network, meaning that for both ADHD and autism, this network seems to be defective in kids, in a subset of children. Uh, using this knowledge, basically implicating a network that's shared, um, we were able to identify a, a class of, of compound um, that targets that network and potentially corrects it. So uh, um, here's our, our potential compound. It's, part of, it's a faster race attempt. It's part, part of the race attempt family, which is known to, uh, to, to, to directly affect um, the metabotropic glutamate receptor network that we characterized for both ADHD and autism. We started a clinical trial for ADHD, which is 
um, which we had finished phase one and phase two. So this is, um, we enrolled 30 kids that were positive for the ADHD mutation, uh, and we gave them, uh, this is a, a dose escalation trial. Uh, after four weeks, we, uh, we, we looked for, um, no, we found no adverse effects, and we used this phase one trial to gauge the efficacy, and we saw um, on two scales, here's a clinician rating scale for improvement in attention, um, uh, and here is a parental rating scale for improvement. And we see across the board from week to week, a significant increase in attention um, resulting in a, a successful trial. Uh, so the idea of this is quite simple. Um, hospitals generate lots of, uh, we, there's lots of patients and we generate lots of data. Um, and what we're trying to do is predict the subset of our patients in the hospital uh, that we can target with particular drugs. So a, a traditional clinical trial takes, um, the estimate is something like at least a billion dollars in 10 years to run. So what, what CHOP has been able to do in a very short time is to decrease that time significantly because uh, they enroll their own patients in these studies. They conduct their own genetics on their own patients. They know the ones that are defective. Uh, so by the time we've identified a defective network and a, and a potential drug, we actually know the patients that, uh, that are to be enrolled in such a study. This dramatically cuts down the time and the cost of a clinical trial. And we are able to go from discovery to proof of concept clinical trial within two years um, at a significantly reduced cost uh, because of this groundwork that's been done in building this uh, biobank. Uh, and uh, and large research operation within a clinical um, hospital setting. So in, you know, whereas a clinical, whereas a traditional clinical trial would have to test 100 people to get uh, efficacy in 20, if we can break that number down to 80 or, 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 or a smaller number, if we can target a much smaller number, we can increase the efficacy of clinical trials and decrease the cost dramatically. Um, that's the end of the first part of the talk. Where um, and now I want to shift gears to a different disease that um, that's of interest to me, uh, severe dengue. And uh, as opposed to the beginning of the talk where I talked about patient data in a hospital, this part of the talk um, I did while I was in residency at Stanford, and it's really about open data and how to leverage the power of open data to study a disease like dengue, which is a neglected tropical disease. So for those who may not know, dengue is the world's most important uh, mosquito-borne viral disease, according to the World Health Organization. It causes a flu-like illness, um, epidemic breakouts are what lead to death. It's mosquito-borne, um, and there's, although there are no drugs or um, um, uh, biomarkers for dengue, there's no treatment for dengue, uh, uh, the treatment is in fact in vitro, uh, I'm sorry, the treatment is in fact um, fluids or IV fluids, and in a developing country, um, when everybody is showing up to the emergency room with a nondescript um, flu-like illness, it's difficult to predict who has the cold or some benign disease relative to who actually has life-threatening dengue. So this, the statistics are something like three and a half billion people in the tropical belt of the world are uh, at risk for dengue, about 390 million are infected. Most, you know, most people don't know, four, uh, about three out of four people don't know, but uh, the people that do know, the 100 million that manifest clinically, 2 million cases pro progress to severe dengue and about 21,000 cases die every year. Um, why should we care? Because with global warming and various um, forces at hand, this is actually spreading to the United States. So much like Zika, dengue, um, and other diseases are potentially spreading to the United States. Um, but for now, dengue is actually a neglected tropical disease, although the incidence has been skyrocketing over the last uh, few decades. Um, our goal is we want to predict the 2% of people that are going to get sick. So given somebody that manifests clinically, we want to predict the 2% of uh, people that are going to get sick in the 2 million cases. The traditional clinical course for dengue, like I said, is a pretty nondescript uh, viral prodrome, you know, uh, headache, fever, rash potentially. And a small proportion of people go on to get hemorrhage or, um, um, uh, or, or petechiae and an even smaller proportion go on to have more serious consequences like shock and, event, and eventually die. Uh, the problem with dengue is, the, and because the incidence has been increasing, is the World Health Organization changed the definition of how dengue is uh, to be screened for. So in 1997, 
uh, Dengue was described like this. And in 2009, the definition changed from, from those uh, clear categories to Dengue with warning symptoms and severe Dengue. And based on these number of symptoms, they increased the specificity of who was being screened for Dengue and who was being admitted to the hospital. Uh, and again, the problem is which of these viruses on the differential diagnosis of, of uh, Dengue-like illness, none of these are actually fatal the way that Dengue is. How do we differentiate Dengue from these potential, uh, these other um, viruses? Uh, so one way is, is, is we can actually test for the viral RNA. Dengue, dengue is a single-stranded RNA virus. And, and when I was at Stanford, I was involved in this work to um, identify dengue using sequence of the actual virus. Stanford put out this excellent um, uh, RNA-based uh, assay to measure primers for four variants of dengue, dengue one, dengue two, dengue three, dengue four. Um, and they can, they can identify on day zero of infection, uh, uh, actually on day zero of fever, um, what if, if the patient was indeed infected with dengue or some other virus. Uh, and to do that, Stanford used big data from the public data, i.e. GenBank. GenBank is probably the, the, the largest um, and the oldest, one of the oldest public database um, uh, repositories for sequence, for raw sequence. Uh, there are volumes of GenBank in uh, um, NIH on paper, literally, encyclopedia. It's full of sequence. It's obviously since moved to computers and to, to digital storage. And uh, what this chart shows is that with the advent of next generation sequencing, or this red line here, uh, I mean, we're about to have uh, exponential amounts of data to mine in the public data. So Stanford mined this data to come up with their PCR-based tests for dengue RNA virus. Um, and when I got involved, there was a paucity of dengue 4 in the public data. So we actually went to Trinidad, which is where I'm from, to validate, dengue, uh, to validate Stanford's viral test in serotype 4, which was circulating in Trinidad at the time. <coughs> Again, our, our goal is to be able to predict who is going to get sick. So we went to a different database, this public gene expression um, omnibus, which is potentially one of the other largest databases of biomedical um, data that's available. Geo, the gene expression omnibus has been around since the year 2000, and there are over 2 million digital samples that have been deposited. Um, as you can see, the majority of these samples are gene expression profiling by array. So before we were in this sequencing um, era of genetics and genomics, uh, most of the high throughput data generated was from gene expression analysis. Um, and microarrays were the first sort of um, mainstream or, or, or rapidly adopted um, um, type of technology used to generate this data. Obviously, since then, gene expression, uh, next generation sequencing, i.e. RNA-seq, has come to the fore and will inevitably overtake uh, microarray um, data. However, for now, the bulk of the data in GEO is microarray. So what we did, um, and GEO is high funded, uh, is high quality funded data, R01 funded data. Uh, last time I checked, and this, this is probably an underestimate today, is 32,000 publications have derived from, from GEO data. And the, the problem is this data just sits on uh, a server and very, and it's hardly, it, it's, it's underutilized. So I just said, uh, dengue is one of the world's worst neglected tropical diseases, called 20,000 people every year. And using public data, I was able to perform a, a multinational um, study to try to identify prognostic, prognostic biomarkers for dengue. I predict um, not only if viral sequence is in there to confirm the diagnosis, but predict based on the human response to that virus, who's actually going to get sick and succumb and potentially succumb to the virus. Succumb to the virus. Um, again, here is this biomarker that, um, we, is, uh, I'm sorry, here is this pipeline, a very similar pipeline that we use to find genetic biomarkers for ADHD. Um, it's a very similar pipeline, except instead of genetic data, we have genomic RNA um, expression from NCBI GEO. Uh, we do a kind of analysis called a meta-analysis where we reason across multiple studies to find robust differentially expressed genes. We um, amass multiple genes into some kind of signature. We can look for biomarkers and targeted therapies and rapidly get to proof of concept clinical trials with this approach. So with my analysis on, with my meta-analysis of dengue across, um, this international meta-analysis across a number of countries, 
I was able to implicate TNF-alpha from the top 10 genes predicted to be defective at Bengal. So here's TNF-alpha pulled out of those top 10 genes. Uh, and we know for a fact that pathogenesis of dengue demise does indeed involve TNF-alpha. So here's from a recent review, or from a, a classic review of dengue and the impact of TNF-alpha. And now I can predict, based on the open data that we use, 80% of the time, who's actually going to um, have more severe symptoms of dengue. Um, and what we can do, given a gene expression signature, right, so meaning what are the top genes that are defective um, in people that get sick from dengue versus people who don't get sick from dengue. And if I line these genes up here, there's a whole list of uh, drugs or the gene expression signatures of drug response. So we can very, you can clearly see from this, this, this figure here how we can have one signature for dengue and a whole list of candidates to correct uh, the severe dengue uh, symptoms that a patient may uh, experience. Uh, and this library, this links, this library of integrated network-based cellular signatures um, is public data that sits out on the internet that one uh, can use to help prioritize any list, any disease with the potential, uh, with thousands of drugs that have been tested for their gene expression to drug response uh, in cell lines. So our development plan for dengue is uh, continued validation of prognostic uh, biomarkers. Uh, we're developing a multiplex scalable test, one of the problems with dengue that it is indeed neglected. So we have to go to countries like Trinidad, where I'm from, and Cuba, where there are good health systems and uh, health records to try to develop these these uh, tests. It's very difficult to find patients that succumb from dengue because it's so rare, and it's very. Uh, we have to be pretty lucky um, and, and and be pretty fastidious to find patients that are going to um, be able to uh, to, to find um, samples uh, to test our uh, prognostic biomarker. On, or prognostic biomarkers on our 10 gene panel. Uh, and we also want to try this list of drugs that we've identified. We want to try validation and uh, model organisms to see if there's any evidence uh, that we should take it to the uh, And with that, I want to switch directions yet again to, um, to what my lab is working on now. So I'm an assistant professor at UCSF. Uh, the work I showed before was from two, for, was work I had done from two mentors. And it sort of has motivated uh, what my lab is focused on, which is really massively collaborative uh, analysis to fuel clinical innovation and, and potentially disrupt medicine. So we've talked already about a couple different uh, databases that are in the public domain that we can use to, um, to, get, to make scientific inquiry or some kind of instance about disease. One is the gene expression omnibus that we just talked about for dengue. The other one um, was the Lynx, which is a drug, um, a drug response uh, resource that can be used in conjunction with, with GEO to come up with potential drugs. Um, but there's a whole lot more. There's a database of genes um, and pathways, genotypes and phenotypes. Um, there's the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is um, uh, DNA, RNA, and very, uh, very high resolution um, cancer data. Um, and a whole lot more. There's, there's, there's databases on target identification like GEO. There's um, StringDB, which is really proteins, and Unipro, which is proteins, array express, and PEG. PEG is um, well known for pathway analysis. Um, there's all kinds of databases that will be involved in any potential drug discovery, like LINKS. There's PubChem, which is actually side groups and their functional effects on drugs. Ingenuity incorporates pathways and drugs. And of course, um, at, the, at the most translational level, there's clinical trials databases or, or, or databases of results from clinical trials. Clinical trials that Gov is probably the most famous. Uh, a tool viewed as uh, uh, has been spearheading import, which is um, um, data, an immune repository uh, for clinical data. EPIC is electronic novel evidence. All of these, uh, all of these different data stores are large, are rich, are relatively complete, and uh, the focus of my lab is really how to integrate them uh, to come up with more powerful predictions. Um, however, the biggest problem with some of these data stories is that they're not properly annotated. Uh, they're not structured for big data analysis. While we may have in place very powerful algorithms um, to do what we wish to do, the problem is the data is not organized well enough for us to apply on a large scale, the algorithms that we have. Text mining and other computational approaches are not precise enough to be clinical grade. Um, 
So one solution that my lab is pursuing quite avidly is open and easily accessible online tools to interpret big data towards more translational opportunities. So let's revisit dengue. As I said, the definition, the World Health Organization changed the definition of dengue and as such, that change is reflected in, in, in the data that's been deposited over the last 20 years for dengue. So here's the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different studies. And you can see how um, the people that generate the data, you can see how that data was, was described, how the actual samples, the digital samples were described. So early on, people would say DSS for dengue shock syndrome, DF for dengue fever, DHF for dengue hemorrhagic fever. Uh, and then later on, some people would write those words out uh, here is one study, the second to last one, where there's who stage three and who stage four, very, very detailed um, descriptors to the people that put this in there, what that means, but not necessarily to anybody else who wants to use this data. So very simply, we made an app to do that, to, for, for people that are interested in, in using this data to very quickly normalize the phenotypes so that they all mean the same thing. So here's an example of, um, and we put it in a, on an online website called the Search Tag Analyze Resource for GEO, stargeo.org. So this was NIH funded as really an attempt to engage large crowds of people to help to organize this data and to use it to discover uh, their own, you know, to answer their own questions and perform their own scientific inquiry. So suffice it to say, we expose all of the raw underlying data that's been deposited by the sample depositors um, and we let the public or the, the biomedical community, med students, uh, postdocs, um, whomever, ask questions with this data. Um, uh, so the original version of, of, of the Star Geo app, there were um, about 12,000 um, experiments that had been deposited in the public data of human gene expression profiling by array, about almost half a million samples. Um, and to date, we've annotated uh, 278 pieces of information across multiple um, studies. Um, and we've done a number of analyses, uh, which are some of which I'll take you through today. So, so here's dengue being analyzed on stargeo.org. Basically, uh, we're looking for things for, for um, patients that either had severe shock or hemorrhage versus people that had just dengue fever with no um, serious outcomes. And we see a list of genes, two of the genes here, Elaine and LTF. Um, are known to be involved in the TNF alpha, uh, alpha pathway. Um, once we can put a URL essentially on an analysis of data that's in the public domain, then we can use modern tools like Twitter or Facebook or other social networks to um, recruit people to do this. So here's um, a, a, a tweet I sent out uh, soon after we built the website and we were able to recruit um, this gentleman here, I'm the PhD candidate in uh, medical school at Chicago, and um, him and his, a group of his friends from medical school were able to make half a million annotations across a spectrum of disease. So basically use unstructured data that's in the public domain, high quality data, and structure it so we can ask more important questions. We're close to, uh, uh, we're close to a million samples today. This slide is also a little bit dated. Um, and what it shows is that um, about a group of, uh, this is nine users, basically, a group of nine users um, were able to go through the public data, make half a million annotations um, in about a, a, just over a, a year period. And in green is the annotations that were made twice, uh, in green and in red. So in green annotations were made twice, and the two different annotators agreed 100% on what the um, sample was, i.e. dengue fever versus dengue shock versus maybe cancer versus not cancer. So this is 100% interator in green and a very small proportion of people disagreed. And those are the, those are the uh, uh, pieces of information that are probably more difficult to annotate, as in who's stage one and who's stage two with reference to dengue. Uh, so we immediately have a way to check the annotations for the ones that are accurate versus the ones that are inaccurate because we put it online. We can ask large people, large groups of people to help us. So we did exactly that for breast cancer. We asked, we looked at the samples we had crowdsourced, the digital, digital annotations we had crowdsourced, and we asked what are the differential genes between samples with breast cancer versus samples without breast cancer. And we looked at TCGA. TCGA is another one of these large data um, sets, public data sets funded by the NIH. 
which actually is one study that has that information, gene expression for cases with cancer, breast cancer, versus gene expression for cases without cancer. And what I'm showing here is the top um, is basically um, the genes. There's a high correlation between differentially expressed genes that I pull out of star geo versus differentially, ex differentially expressed genes that I pull out of TCGA. And the top 100 genes are probably the ones that most people, that, that most people care about. Um, out of the top 200 genes, the top 100 agree for both overexpressed and underexpressed gene run average, right? So 92 out of the top 200 underexpressed genes agree from both analyses. The public data, STAR-GEA versus the highly curated TCGA, and 98 out of the top 200 genes uh, that are overexpressed are also agree. So we think we pull out very similar signals to what um, to other data sets that cost a lot more money to generate. Um, and we think um, Star Geo and, and other public data serve as perfect validation resources for this kind of work. And if you can do one disease um, with crowdsourcing and annotate the samples, you can do any number of diseases. So if you ever wonder what a tree of disease looks like, a functional representation of a tree of disease, this is what it looks like. Um, so here's pulmonary adenocarcinoma at the top, hepatic, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, is the second one and so on and so forth. We have gene expression signatures or profiles um, being represented um, in one tree, meaning that pulmonary adenocarcinoma and hepatocellular carcinoma at the top here are functionally similar. So that may suggest a, a physician or a, a researcher might investigate drugs that may be shared across those diseases or biomarkers that may be shared across those diseases. So this kind of work um, converges into what I call a clinically useful ICD. So the ICD is probably um, the most famous classification of disease, except not one doctor uses the ICD uh, to help um, manage their patients or their patients' disease. Uh, billing departments and administrative staff use the ICD to, con to conduct the commerce of business, but it's hardly, it's been very difficult to come up with some kind of clinically relevant ICD, and I, uh, I can pose it that this is a potential way. Mining the very large stores of public data is one way to do so. Um, and one more thing before I move on. So the second part of this talk is really about digital health. Precision medicine, um, you know, to most academics probably is genomics and drug discovery, uh, but there's more to health than just, you know, than just diagnostics. And I think the digital health revolution is one way that we can leverage um, um, readily commoditized hardware, i.e. mobile phones and Apple Watches and so on, to, to evoke precision medicine. So digital health is the convergence of the digital and genomic revolutions with health, healthcare, living, and society. Digital health is empowering people to better track, manage, and improve their own and their family's health, live better, more productive lives, and improve society. Um, and as I said, emerging technologies are, are generating Bigger and larger data stores, richer data stores, sensors are now a reality that, that researchers can use and study. Um, and there are a number of reasons why this uh, is the time to be engaging in digital health research. The, the APIs have become open source and platform independent. Just about every um, major platform, Google to Android to Apple, they all have APIs for some kind of health um, and patient-oriented research. Informed consent is now um, a reality. It can be a part on the phone, which speaks to the scalability of, of using digital health devices uh, to conduct research. Uh, HIPAA-grade um, security is built into much of, this, much of these frameworks, and it just allows for a certain level of interaction with patient populations not currently possible today. And at the same time that digital health is making um, uh, a name for itself, AI is continuing to outperform humans. Um, and I think the marriage of the two, uh, as I hope to convince you, is quite powerful uh, in the context of computational health. The first time I heard about AI was probably in 1997. Uh, I, uh, artificial intelligence outperforming a human when IBM's Big Blue beat the world chess champion at the time. More recently, last year, um, Google developed AI that beat the Chinese uh, Go champion, or, the, 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 the Chinese game of Go, which uh, some, uh, some people describe as a much more complicated version of chess, a Chinese version of chess. Google beat the world Go champion relentlessly, four to one, 
to, to definitely prove that uh, computers are outperforming humans. More recently, this year, um, the, um, the, the Tesla showed that its autopilot, which drives cars, is 40% safer than humans. Um, ironically, they cleared their name in a, a, a crash, um, and what the, what the transport authority found was that indeed autopilot and having computers drive cars is indeed safer than having humans drive cars. How is that possible? So the, what makes that possible is this type of artificial intelligence called deep learning. So deep learning is it's not a new concept, but it is making a uh, it is making a name for itself today. It's been around since the 1980s, and it's based on good old neural networks. Um, it's it's becoming apparent, and it's it's emerging today because of the um, availability of GPU computation, which is needed, highly parallelized computation, which is needed to perform very large and complex um, um, computation in order to train these, these neural networks. And uh, because the networks are so large, they require, they also require very large data sets to estimate appropriately. So the way I think about this is uh, the majority of statistical modeling is actually linear. An equation of a line is actually two things. It's a gradient and a y-intercept. So from two data points, we can actually plot a line. Uh, that is not the case for deep learning models. Uh, for some of the most sophisticated deep learning models, there are more um, parameters to set than there are atoms in the universe. So what that means is deep learning is, by definition, a stochastic process, uh, which means if you train the same model, um, complicated model on the same set of big data and you do it independently, the models will learn slightly different things. Um, much like a child being, uh, you know, trained to, 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 to be an adult. Uh, um, and deep learning really made its, its, its name in 2012 in this ImageNet competition. So ImageNet is an annual competition that's been going on since 2010, where the goal is to classify 1.2 million objects into 1,000 categories. Uh, it's a traditional computer vision image classification problem. And in 2012, the first deep learning approach that used strictly data, um, strictly big data, to make inference emerged, meaning no longer were people defining curves or defining lines or defining colors in their algorithms. They were letting the computer figure out what to do. And since then, deep learning has dominated ImageNet. Uh, right now, humans achieve superhuman performance in image classification, meaning more than 95% accuracy, meaning Google's AI can tell a blurry or out of focus image of a cat or a dog better than a human can do. Um, and, and again, this is very analogous to how children and how brain development works, right? So in this recent piece uh, published in Nature Neuroscience, um, we see the brain and the visual recognition system of the brain uh, we learned in medical school that there's a highly complex and nested system that goes on in the brain where you have um, light hitting uh, cells of the retina and it goes through from the, or, um, it goes to the lateral genuclear nucleus to V1 to V2 to V3 and so on and so forth until your brain can say this is an image of a dog or a cat or whatever it is. Well, computers do the same thing. Uh, light from pixels of a digital image uh, are actually fed into this network uh, that's very similar in, in design, at least, in the, in the sense that they're nested layers of processing uh, in order to infer what exactly that, that um, image is. Uh, so the way I think about it is that machine learning is to big data as human learning is to life experience. We interpolate and extrapolate from past experiences to deal with unfamiliar situations. And now machine learning with big data, data duplicates this at massive scales. So we're, so we're moving from a computational paradigm of telling computers what to do, right? So when I learned to program computers, I had to know what to do in order to tell a computer what to do. I had to know how to solve a problem before I can sh tell a computer how to solve that problem. We're moving away from telling computers what to do to really just showing them what to do. We don't actually need to know what, what needs to be done. We just need to know what the answer is and let the computer figure it out automatically. Uh, so let's take a good example of where this could come into play. So melanoma, um, is among the most deadly uh, cancers. Uh, it's estimated that a person dies from melanoma around the world every hour on average. Um, in the US, um, it's the fifth most common cancer in America. Uh, and this year, it's estimated somewhere, somewhere close to 70,000 people are gonna be, um, gonna be diagnosed with melanoma in America and about 9,000 
are going to die. Um, however, it's very, it's very curable. If melanoma is caught early and excised, um, it's almost, it's 97% curable. The problem comes when we don't catch melanoma early and that mole progresses into a, a carcinoma or, um, um, and then it goes on to metastasize and patients have problems. Overdiagnosis remains a problem because it is so easy um, to cut a mole out that may not be melanoma. The problem is the current methods to, 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 to classify a, benign, a pigmented lesion as benign or malignant are poor. The specificity is about 60%. Um, not only that, 36 biopsies are needed to catch one melanoma. That's at an incredible cost, somewhere close to $673 million uh, in extra costs are uh, imparted on the health system because of this. So our goal is really to develop an objective clinical grade diagnostic for melanoma. As I said, the way that melanoma is diagnosed currently is completely subjective. So here is this A, B, C, D, E method that medical students learn and residents learn where the asymmetry, border, color, um, and so on of the mole are used to make a judgment. There are other methods, none of them really are um, accurate. Uh, at the same time, a lot of selfies are taken, right? So in, in 2014, something like 93 uh, million selfies were taken on Android alone, um, right? So these numbers are probably underestimates now since the slide is a couple of years old, but 25,000 um, pictures are taking, taken um, by young adults in their lifetime, right? And then about 30% of them uh, are, are taken by young adults. Um, Something, the statistics are, are, are somewhat alarming. In, in, in 2015, more people died taking selfies, 12 than by shark attack. So our goal is really to turn the selfie into an instrument um, of, of, of doing good and actually using um, a technique like deep learning, combine it with the fact that people are taking selfies um, at uncontrollable rates to maybe try to catch melanoma earlier. And the idea is quite simple. So we have an iPhone app that we've designed uh, to screen, to use smartphones with deep learning accuracy to screen. So we've designed an iPhone app. We, uh, we have a large database of images that have been labeled by their underlying pathology. And what we're doing is using the same state-of-the-art image recognition algorithms that have been used, that have been trained on dogs and cats to win ImageNet. We're training them on basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and malignant melanoma. And the idea is over time, as we collect more images in the clinic, we actually have medical students in the clinic collecting images for us and following the pathology. Um, we estimate about one student can collect about a thousand images on an iPhone in the clinic um, that are labeled by pathology. And what we, what we, what we wanna do is grow that over time at UCSF in our hospital health system and we expect that the accuracy of our algorithms are gonna increase over time. So currently, we can achieve an AEC, an area of the curve of 0.967. That corresponds to a sensitivity of about 100% and a specificity of about 82%. Uh, practically, that translated a number needed to excise of four. On average, the number needed to excise of moles to catch one melanoma is anywhere from 10 to an expert dermatologist to 30 or even 40 for a more general practitioner. So already we think with our approach, we can improve the efficiency and the precision in screening for melanoma using smartphones. And again, this is only 1300 images that we uh, acquired from the public data. Uh, Stanford has done this on a much larger level. Uh, they've acquired 129,000 images from public and private data stores across 2,000 different labels of disease. And they show very similar um, accuracy to what we have. So what this means is this technology is readily available. Um, given enough data, the algorithms exist, and, and, uh, and it really is uh, well poised to make a clinical impact uh, very soon. So again, to end uh, this part of the talk and probably the presentation, uh, the same pipeline that can lead to proof of concept clinical trials applies not only to genomics data, uh, not only to genetics data, but to any kind of big data. So here's an example where the data is pixel features, right? So we have an algorithm or an app to capture, we call it skin deep to capture the um, images in the clinic. We have pixels as features. We have deep learning to learn patterns of those pixels that correspond to labeled outcomes, i.e. pathology. Um, and we can use the algorithm to predict 
in the clinic patients that will go on to have melanoma. And our goal is to really have this implemented in the clinic and FDA approved in very short order to help improve and potentially catch melanoma earlier and decrease the death rate. Um, and with that, I think I'd like to end. Uh, I have a couple of acknowledgements. Um, the first part of the talk uh, about ADHD and, and genetics was done at the Center for Biogenomics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Hakan Hakan Arson's group. Many thanks to Dr. Hakan Arson. Uh, the second part of the talk um, I was a resident at Stanford. I was working in a tool buttes group. Uh, really showed me the power of open data and sort of the things that data can achieve. And now the last part of the talk, digital health, is, is what my lab, my new lab, is focusing on at UCSF. Um, definitely want to make specific mention of Abhishek, Maria, Simone, Michael, Andrew, and Albert. They've been awesome in helping set up this melanoma project, and they're very excited moving forward. Um, and to end, let me just end with a quote from my mentor, a tool. Data is power, data is revolution, data is frozen knowledge. And I uh, completely endorse uh, that statement. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hadley, for your informative presentation. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them in the Q&A box found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Dr. Hadley will answer as many questions as time permits. Uh, and Dr. Hadley, the first question um, uh, for today asks, what are some of the difficulties uh, to, to doing translational research? Sure, thank you, Christina. Um, yeah, so I think the biggest difficulty in doing translational research is really asking the right question. Uh, we generate so much data today uh, in the clinics, um, online, we share it, we put it everywhere. Um, arguably, the, the, the answer to whatever question we want probably is already in the public data or in the data that we generate. And the key is to, ans is to ask the right question. Um, so translational research involves some, um, some level of computer science and some level of medicine. And I think critical to doing translational research in the future is finding and educating um, individuals who really have a good grasp of both of those fields. In my experience, most uh, physicians uh, that go through medical school really are not exposed to any kind of computational or any kind of data um, analytics or, or, or even basic uh, basic tenets of how biomedical translational research is done. And I think uh, having a better synergy between computer scientists and having less uh, stark barriers between computer science and medicine, I think with the the future really is uh, lies in both of those uh, disciplines and sort of having experts work together more closely, but the same expert being well versed in both of those fields. Thank you for your answer, Dr. Hadley. Uh, the second question of the day asks, what are some of the obstacles preventing the uptake of precision medicine research in clinics? Sure. Um, yeah, I think the answer to this one is, is quite multifactorial. Um, at the first level, uh, I think the FDA has to uh, uh, become more involved in in precision medicine type of uh, trials where there's a test before patients are treated. I think uh, the current level of regulatory science uh, is lacking far behind the pace of discoveries and innovations that we're making in biomedical research and in, uh, in, in developing precision medicine. I think uh, uh, physicians need to be educated more about the benefits and sort of the availability of precision medicine. Most of the um, impact today is actually being made in rare diseases and it's difficult to, to, to know really what is available for all of these rare diseases. So uh, experts in the field really need to be um, on top of the literature uh, and need to educate uh, and need to be educated as to what the potential benefits for the patients are. 
Um, and I think finally, from the health system infrastructure standpoint, um, it, it's quite curious to me that we have entire departments dedicated to coding patient data uh, to seek for reimbursement or for payment, you know, as in the ICD example I gave in my Gundry talk, but we don't have uh, research uh, departments coding this information uh, to, uh, to, to sort of give back to the patient themselves. Right, so we generate lots of data in clinical medicine. We're generating at breakneck speed, and I think uh, a lot of that responsibility really is on the healthcare institution to make that data usable to people like myself and others who may be interested in uh, using it for more deeper or for deeper scientific inquiry. Thank you. And our last question, as we are running short on time, what role do you see for genomics in the ensuing mobile and digital health revolution? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, genomics. So genomics, uh, genome was sequenced in 2003. So it's been 15 odd years of uh, of being in the era of genomics. I think, um, um, I think the future is far brighter than, than the past. I think there's been a lot of um, emphasis on genomics and you know, 10, 10 years ago, um, everyone thought we would have all kinds of new drugs and new biomarkers and new interventions. Uh, that has not necessarily been the case. Um, and I think the future uh, genomics um, I think the future interaction of genomics with other uh, pieces of technology, much like mobile health and digital health, uh, much like artificial intelligence, is very exciting. I mean, genomics is, by definition, big data stores, and this is what powers the AI of today. I think uh, uh, dissecting medicine into, it's not just drugs and it's not just diagnostics, there's a whole screening aspect to medicine and population health, um, and I think combining uh, the potential for digital and mobile devices for that very important screening um, functionality. That's the first entry of patients into the healthcare system. Um, use genomics for some more diagnostic approaches. Uh, I think that combination will be quite powerful from a public health perspective and in, in, um, in maintaining um, uh, the, the health of the population. Dr. Hadley, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you once again for your presentation. I'd also like to thank our audience for joining us today and thank LabRoots for today's educational webcast. The webcast can be viewed on demand through May 2017. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. I'll see you next time here at labroots.com. Goodbye.